to the Hope for the Animals podcast, sponsored by United Poultry Concerns. I'm your host, Hope Bohannock, and you can find all our past shows by going to our website, hopefortheanimalspodcast.org, and you can find my contact information there as well. I would love to hear from you. So this is our fifth and final installment of our Micro Sanctuary series, and today I'm having a conversation with Quincy Markowitz. Quincy is the co-founder of Farm Bird Sanctuary in Wisconsin, and I seem to be, I'm saying it more and more these days, but I love having the perspective of 30 years in the vegan community and seeing the significant changes in the movement and evolutions and and also in the larger society. And one of those is our human relationship to chickens. For all of human history, pretty much our only relationship with chickens has been one of dominance and commerce, seeing them as a commodity and as a food source. We've used them for their eggs and their flesh. They're either in a building near the house or on an industrial scale, massive amounts of birds crammed into windowless warehouses, suffering out of sight. But that relationship began to change about 40 or so years ago when the concept of sanctuary started to emerge. So for the past few decades, there's been another way for humans, generally compassionate vegan humans, to relate to chickens, and that is to rescue them and allow them to live their lives out in peace on a sanctuary. And now even that is shifting, and from this relationship of rescue and care and compassion on a larger scale with large numbers of animals and the space that they're in being kind of far away from the human's living space, there's those that are shifting this relationship even more, and they're doing more individualized care, bringing birds into their homes, caring for just one or a few, a smaller number, more individualized attention and connection. This is micro-sanctuary work. Whether or not someone called it that or not, and this of course started before you know the, the, the term micro-sanctuary was coined, But it's starting to look more and more now like the relationship that we have with other animals in our lives, namely dogs and cats and others like rabbits and other species of birds, companion animals. This is really an interesting evolution, and, and I've really loved doing this micro-sanctuary series. I've, I've learned so much, and it's really caused me to kind of rethink what I thought I knew about sanctuary or what I thought a sanctuary was. For so many years, to me, farmed animal sanctuaries were places that you had to drive for hours out to the country to get to, and they were large, farm-like places all spread out with hundreds of animals. But the new micro-sanctuary movement is really turning that model upside down, or, or should I say it's adding to it, it's expanding on it, because of course we still want these large sanctuaries to continue their work, they play a vital role in the movement, but micro sanctuaries create caregiving in more situations, more applications, rescue and care with differing numbers of animals in a variety of settings, and even different species of animals, as we saw with the fish rescue in this series. And once this one is completed, I'm going to put the other four, all five, together in a Micro Sanctuary series page so you can find them all together on the website in the drop down menu of episodes. So let's hear our final conversation in the Micro Sanctuary series with Quincy Markowitz, who is the co founder of Farm Bird Sanctuary, a bird only sanctuary located in southern Wisconsin. Quincy's been working with chickens for over 10 years and also engages in community actions, including a campaign against a chicken toss event every year. And we'll be talking about what that is later in the interview. So let's bring in Quincy. (music) 
Hi, Quincy. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you here. So Quincy, tell us a little about you. Why did you go vegan? When did you go vegan? What is your superhero origin story? Uh, Because all vegan activists are superheroes. So what got you into this work? What got you into rescuing chickens? And, And when did you go vegan? Tell us about you. Sure. So my origin story is actually um, heavily revolved around a rooster called Sunny, who I met about 10 years ago at another sanctuary. Um, I had just been invited there by a cousin of mine. He was volunteering there to kind of check it out. So this was after I had just moved back to my hometown and was just kind of figuring out what my interests were and what I wanted to do. And I went out there and I met this leghorn rooster called Sunny, and it was absolutely love at first sight. I had (laughs) no interest in birds. Um, I really wouldn't even consider myself an animal lover before that moment. And he was a leghorn rooster. I didn't know anything about chickens or birds or really animals at the time. I certainly wasn't vegan. That wasn't even on my radar, Um, but I met him and fell in love and I started volunteering at the sanctuary and I really kind of, you know, took him on. He took me under his wing and really showed me kind of the ropes. He was, he had a lot of chronic illnesses. So we were learning about each other really quickly. Um, I would often take him to my apartment, like when he was recovering from sedation or procedures at the vet. I was in my early twenties and I just returned home after living in New York. um, And I was newly sober. So that's another kind of important part of my story is I really think I was looking for those connections. And because of where I was, it was um, easier to merge with more vulnerable beings. So um, luckily, I was still in college. uh, So I was able to switch my major. I actually got a major in animal welfare, which is a major that I created and proposed to the University of Wisconsin. So I have a, yeah, I have a bachelor's of science in animal welfare with a focus on ornithology classes, which is birds. Hmm, So it's great. It's all sunny. (laughs) He changed. And then I have a big tattoo of him on my back. I mean, he showed me who chickens are. I quickly looked into other chicken rescues and got hooked up with um, Mary Britton Klaus and Bert from Chicken Run Rescue. And they just became my mentors. I went vegan. The first day I went up there, Mary told me, you can't rescue chickens and eat eggs. Just very blunt told me that. And I remember thinking, what is she talking about? And I stopped eating eggs when I returned back to Madison. So Mm. that was the start of my vegan journey and really understanding that we can't rescue birds and exploit them in any way. Wow. What a, what a wonderful story. I'm (laughs) it's so I've, I've really, I've heard of other people being enamored or connect feeling connected to an animal on a farm sanctuary, but rarely a rooster. And I love that, that Sunny the rooster that was really who drew you in even before you were vegan. I I just, I love that. It feels like destiny, like you were meant to work for and with them. I love it. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and, and I just briefly, what was wrong with Sonny? You said he had a lot of issues. Uh, what were the health issues he had? He had, we believe he had like compromised immune system um, and he would get, he got a fungal infection at one point. We just really didn't know a lot about his care, what we were doing at the time. So we were taking him to a vet and trying different medications. I ended up knowing him for about three years before he passed. And I mean, he fought and he fought really hard and he passed under sedation one day. Oh, what a sweet story. I loved (laughs) hearing about Sunny. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. So now you, now fast forward 10 years later, you have Farm Bird Sanctuary. And I want to hear about your sanctuary. Where do the birds live? Do they live inside, outside? What's the setup? And and would you consider what you do a micro sanctuary? Tell us about Farm Bird Sanctuary. So Farm Bird Sanctuary, we are a sanctuary in Southern Wisconsin in Edgerton, which is just outside of Janesville, Wisconsin and Madison, Wisconsin, between those two places. Right now, all of our birds do currently live inside. So we have 59 chickens, five quails, different species, and three turkeys. Uh, This year is kind of our year of infrastructure. So we just moved to our current property three years ago. So I started Farmbird Sanctuary in 2016. 
in an apartment. And that was absolutely a micro sanctuary. It was a two bedroom flat in Madison. So um, I think the most birds I had at any point was 17. I had some house roosters that I kept inside and very understanding neighbors. And then um, it was always my goal to move and start a larger sanctuary. And my partner who is also vegan and has been into birds his whole life um, had the same goal. So it just really was a wonderful opportunity to move out to where we are. And we live in a big old farmhouse. Um, We take up one room and then every other. So like the whole upstairs is all chicken rooms. The basement's all chicken room. And we have our disabled house chickens, uh, our cats and our dog on the ground floor with us. And we have um, lots of runs outside and we actually carry the birds to and from the runs um, by hand. We have a lot of individual groups and we carry them in and out. And when it's nice enough, some of them do live in outdoor coops. And I know that you also have kind of a specialty with, with disabled birds and or special care, special needs birds. Can you tell us about uh, some of that work? Yeah, so disabled birds has always felt very important to us. Um, We started, so I would say I started the sanctuary with an ex-fighting rooster called Kelvin, and he had severe PTSD and a lot of um, really high needs. He really, um, he was quite aggressive and really needed to be understood and given his space. Um, We loved him. So we wanted to give him everything that he needed and what he needed was not to be around humans very much because he was fought for years and years. Mm. I always knew that I really loved animals that were going to be a little bit more high needs. I also think that as a bird exclusive sanctuary, pretty much exclusively chickens, that we have the knowledge and ability to care for disabled birds. I think a lot of people do have the ability as long as you know, they're providing lots of vet care and really figuring out what these birds need and want. When we see disabled birds, we know that they are at much greater risk of facing death if they're not, if a home isn't found for them. So it's always just been important for us to apply our expertise where we can and, you know, bond, bond with these birds that need, need a little extra help. I love that. And I I know also I've seen pictures and I know people might not understand, but when you have chickens in the house, you can have uh, chicken diapers. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) And I know this is a question sometimes people have, well, how do you, what do you do about cleaning? And do you, do you keep your chickens in diapers? Only one. We only keep flapjack in diapers all the time. Um, He is a disabled Cornish rooster. So he sits often and we have found just gets too messy if he's not wearing a diaper he just kind of gets really dirty I've never been big on diapers my (laughs) partner Todd would would prefer if I like diapers a little bit more but I generally (laughs) prefer just cleaning up after them Um, all of our chickens in the house live in pack and plays and we just use like towels and sheets and change those out every day they're you know they're quite good at cleaning themselves and staying away from their poop. So I don't find it necessary to keep them diapered. I also don't have human children. So I have no desire to change diapers all day. (laughs) Uh (laughs) So yeah, I mean, I prefer, I prefer to just let them go for it. Uh, Most of our chickens live in like separated runs. So our setup is really, it's a lot of monogamous couples because we specialize in disabled birds with very high needs. So we have Fiddle who has one leg, So he can only be around, you know, smaller hens and we have a lot of ex fighting roosters. So we have um, eight ex fighting roosters. So they can never be around other roosters because they've been trained to fight. So they really need monogamous relationships with hens or more hens, of course, if you can rescue more, but our focus is generally roosters. It's kind of the nature of this work. Hens are a lot easier to place. So we have, almost exclusively groups of two or three. And where do your birds come from generally? Where do you, uh, do people seek you out for the rescues? Do you work with shelters? How do you get the birds uh, that come into your care? And do you adopt any out? Yeah, so we're primarily a sanctuary. So we don't do a lot of adopting out. Um, It's just me and my partner, Todd, that run it. And so we don't, 
have like the resources to be a big adopting place, but we do do a few events. So we're going to, I know we're going to touch on an event we uh, protest against called Pioneer Days. So every year, the last couple of years, we've been able to get about 25 chickens. And so I do adopt them out. And then like big last year, there was an egg farm collapse in Iowa and it was a big egg company and they, the farmer could no longer afford to feed the chickens due to COVID. So they were letting them starve to death. And the farmer was letting, it was 160,000 chickens and the farmer was letting people come and just take the chickens. Mm. So when there's situations like that, when time is absolutely of the essence, uh, we had 90 of those birds in our home at one point wow. um, in two different rooms. So there are times that we will use our resources, especially again, in an instance like that, when they're literally starving to death, we're able to pull whoever we can. So we do some big events like that. Otherwise we are contacted a lot with cockfighting bots and we generally try to help in those. A lot of our roosters come from being dumped uh, because they've been bought as hens and end up being roosters. Yeah. And then Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, because people often buy chicks for backyard keeping and eggs and don't realize that some are roosters. It's hard to sex the babies and uh, roosters get put in the box with the hens and then they grow and, and suddenly they have a rooster that they don't want, right? Right. And humans that are buying chickens aren't told the truth. They are told like grossly over-exaggerated numbers about we're 95% accurate at sexing, let's say, and that's just not really possible, nor do the hatcheries face any repercussions if they're wrong, of course. So, right. yeah. so of course, it's as much an industry problem as it is an individual problem. But um, I mean, I would say oops, roosters is what we call them and that they make up hundreds of our, probably 95% of our requests. Um, mm-hmm. And we don't take them as owner surrenders because we would just be overwhelmed tomorrow if we did. Mm. But of course, once they've been dumped, that is, that's time for, it's a necessary intervention at that time. So you mentioned the pioneer days, and I think this is where this chicken toss thing happens, this horrible practice that I know you've done work on. And so I I wanted to ask you about that, this, what is this chicken toss and where do they do it? And what, what is the work you've done to try to stop it? So the chicken toss happens in Ridgeland, Wisconsin. Um, I believe it's been going on for 41 years now. We, I don't even recall how I originally heard of it, but we, the first time we went was in 2017. We just kind of went to check it out. A few, me and maybe four friends went just to see what this chicken toss was all about. We were able to rescue four chickens from the first toss. And that was Two of them were surrendered after being asked, and two of them were caught by us. Um, what, what what exactly is the chick? What, oh, what sorry. Yeah. yeah. What are they doing, these poor chickens? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just assume everyone knows what the chicken toss is, <laughs> and of course, it's not, not a normal thing that most people are thinking of. It takes place during um, Pioneer Days, is what they call it, and... It is um, a series of events. They start with greased pig wrestling. And then at noon, they um, do the chicken toss. This happens every year. And they have, I think it's close to 200, 250 chickens most years that they stand on a roof that's about two stories high. And they throw these chickens into a crowd of hundreds of people. Um, Many adults that are drinking you know, kids are being encouraged to catch these chickens. Um, It's just completely cruel. And Mm. they, you know, they can't fly, of course. And there's the crowd is working on catching them. And um, many chickens are actually killed on the spot or just taken to the processing plant in the town after they've been caught. Mm. And you were able to get a few of them, like you were able to catch some to rescue? Correct. So we participated the first two years. However, we no longer participate because we don't want activists to be responsible for hurting the chickens. We also don't want to participate in this event. So what we do now is we have, we did not do, we didn't go up there to protest this year due to COVID. So I didn't feel safe or comfortable being the leader of an event where people could be 
um, at risk of COVID. So um, we did not go up this year. We plan to go up again next year and every year until it ends. Um, But we do plan to just have surrender stations where we're asking people, a lot of these people that catch them do want them to go to good homes, especially like kids that catch them. A lot of our surrenders are by kids. And a lot of people realize, of course, as we went through before, the majority of these chickens are roosters. And a lot of people don't want the roosters when they catch them. So when we end up getting chickens, I would say 75 to 85% of them are always going to be roosters from pioneer days. Wow. It's just, it's just so, seems so silly. It is. <laughs> and, you know, and why? I mean, uh, and I think it lends itself to my next question which is about categorizing animals, domesticated animals, and that we primarily categorize animals in two categories, friends or food. I mean, that may be an oversimplification, but, but, but we would never be tossing dogs off the roof, right? Right. right. <laughs> I mean, it's because we consider them in the friend category. Uh, so, so my question is, how do our speciesist views come into play when we're considering chickens? And of course, speciesism is when we consider one species dominant or more important than another. So what can we do to help people think about chickens more as companion animals and our friends and not as commodities? Yeah, I think that presenting them as our friends and family members is crucial. I work at um, a pet store to make my money, the nonprofit um, I manage, but I actually bring a rooster with me every time I work. Hmm. So, so they do a lot of like interaction with customers. I've had, I bring Pluto with me most of the time, I rooster Pluto, and he's just amazing. And everyone, you know, is so surprised that he's, people always ask if chickens, you know, have personalities and things like that. <laughs> and of course they do. So yeah. I think that presenting them as people deserving of respect and love is, is really important. I don't, I don't think it's enough for us to say you know, chickens are amazing. They should be companions. I think showing it is, is really helpful. Um, and it really makes people connect to them. And I find that to be a really important part of activism. I also think that, I think that we want to just show that they're individuals and that they have every right to live every, all the same rights that we have to live. But, you know, I try not to showcase them as intelligent or, nice or kind or, or innocent or pure, because once we start categorizing life worth based on these aspects, I think that showing that chickens are really great and, you know, they deserve to live is, is important to show how affectionate they can be. But I think we also want to avoid lending too much to that because my chickens who don't go to the store with me, um, my chicken Turkey boy, who was fought for years and years and is incredibly aggressive and it needs to be handled with care. He is as worthy of love and life. He is as beautiful and amazing as Pluto is who can come to work with me and be kind. So I think that we definitely want to avoid trying to attribute things like kindness or intelligence, purity to non-humans. Um, it lends itself to those things being valued um, in humans. And I don't, I don't think we want that. We don't want intelligence to be a basis of, of worth. Right. We don't want to say that, well, just because they're so intelligent is the reason that we should protect them or uh, spare their lives. Intelligence shouldn't be a a factor (laughs) in anyone's human or non-human in the worth of their lives. Yeah. And so I do, we do try to talk about our, our chickens that aren't as, as human friendly because, um, you know, no one, no one owes us anything to call our sanctuary home. Yeah. And likewise, I would think you're right. It kind of goes the same way with animals that are kind or friendly or nice to humans 
that shouldn't be a factor either, whether we protect them or not. Right. They have they yep. they have every mm -hmm. right to be angry and mean. And, exactly. And or want hearts, to be around their own species. Yeah. And bless their hearts that they're not. And they're so forgiving of humans, uh, a lot of them, but, but they are so individual and there's some that aren't going to be as friendly or kind to humans. And that shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter at it all. Shouldn't, right. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Good points. So we talked a little about backyard chicken keeping and the roosters. Keeping chickens now for eggs is very popular and actually has gotten even more popular during the pandemic because people are doing gardens and wanting to access their food from home. And so they're, they're getting chickens for eggs. So what do you think about this? What, how is what you're doing as a micro sanctuary and caring for chickens different than just keeping backyard chickens? And why should we not eat the eggs? And what do you do with the eggs that your hens lay? So we actually don't get a lot of eggs um, because we have so many roosters in particular. And also um, we practice preventative reproductive health care for our hens um, so that they're not forced to lay as many eggs. We do have a few hens that lay eggs, um, including we have someone called Yam, and we've tried three different methods to shut down her laying cycle. And unfortunately, we just, um, nothing works on her and she lays up to two eggs some days. We, you know, we hear her, she lives in the home with us. So we hear her squawking and alarm calling and making the egg noises. And I find humans must convince themselves that those aren't terrible noises because if you've heard a hen lay an egg it sounds painful mm. um, it looks painful eggs are so much bigger compared to the body size than they should be hens any wild bird so wild birds lay 12 to 15 eggs most wild birds do in a clutch um, some birds have multiple clutches every year but they're laying 12 eggs at a time and then incubating all of them and then they're taking care of these babies so if you really think about it, there's no evolutionary aspect to where laying hundreds of eggs a year would be beneficial. It's tolling. It takes calcium from their bones. So a lot of times hens that have been laying for years um, have holes in their bones from where the calcium has been depleted. And then finally, we see diseases such as like egg yolk peritonitis, which is essentially internal laying and it causes infection. That's the number one killer of laying hens that are left to lay. Backyard chicken keepers aren't told this information. They're not sure what to look for. You know, if someone calls me and says their hen's very sick, there's been times that I've gone there, gone to people's houses, you know, to look at their hens. And, you know, I have, I have absolute horror stories of picking up hens that, you know, are being eaten alive by maggots, things like that. People Ooh. just don't, when you see someone as a, as a food source or a commodity, you know, a lot of times people aren't taking them to vets. You ask backyard chicken keepers, you know, if they're going to take their chicken to a vet. And most of the time I get laughed at. Mm -hmm. So people aren't seeing them as deserving of care, which is particularly ironic and cruel considering that they have such high care needs due to how we've bred them. Um, if you talk to multiple species sanctuaries, the ones that provide excellent care I guarantee most of the time you'll hear that their birds cost as much as their mammals do. And I think there's an idea in the backyard chicken keeping community and it, it absolutely leaks over to animal sanctuaries in the vegan world that we can take these birds and it's, it's a small bird, right? We can take and throw 12 to 20 to 30 chickens in a field and free range them. And places that do this are having predator attacks. Backyard chicken keepers are having predator attacks all the time because we're being told that free ranging is the most ethical and we're expecting birds that have no knowledge of our natural, the surroundings in this area, you know, to be able to battle a fox in a, in a fenced in backyard. There's very few messages um, in the backyard chicken community that are, are best for the chickens and, and not just most convenient for the humans. Yeah. Yeah. And I think another factor with, with free ranging is that an open 
grassy area, backyard or pasture or whatever is really not their natural territory, not really a natural setting. They prefer brush and bushes and trees and having places to hide and to fly up to, to nest and to perch. So, and, and if they're in this open area, it can feel scary because you're exposed to predators. So people are thinking that, you know, these, they are seeing these images of free range birds out in these pastures, but that's really not natural, a natural place for them to be. And it's not comfortable for them to be because they feel exposed to predators, right? Absolutely. And especially, um, you know, a lot of people lock them up at night, for, you know, to protect them from things like coyotes and raccoons, but aerial predators are as prominent, you know, even with trees, Cooper's hawks actually stay and hunt in trees. So, you know, even if you have trees, you, you want to make sure that you're still providing aviary netting, but yeah, absolutely. They prefer to perch their uh, domesticated from jungle birds. So they would much prefer a jungle setting to Right. Something like you'd see in Wisconsin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you touched on it a little bit, but I, I wonder if you could talk more about the health of the birds because people don't realize how these poor hens bodies have been so manipulated to lay so many more eggs than they would naturally. And when they're able to live their lives out and not be slaughtered at a very young age, which is always the case in the chicken flesh and chicken egg industries, they often have really serious health issues, reproductive issues. So caring for them can be expensive and intensive. And I don't think people realize that. So can you talk about your experiences with the chicken's health? Yeah. So in general, um, health care costs for hens are um, considered much more than roosters. And at our sanctuary, um, the average hen at our sanctuary is going to cost much, much more uh, than the average rooster um, because they've been lay bred to lay so many eggs and have those reproductive diseases. I mean, I'll tell a story about Petra, who is one of our, our red hens, and um, we've had her about a year, and she was only about a year old when she was surrendered uh, to another rescue who couldn't care for her at the time. So she was surrendered with a really swollen abdomen on the brink of death. She had actually been in like a closed box for so long that she could barely see. Um, she was just dumped at another rescue. So we immediately rushed her to an emergency vet. And she had to be given a shot of something to shut down her laying cycle, as well as antibiotics. She had to have that fluid abdomen drain. So she had egg yolk peritonitis, which is that internal laying. It causes fluid buildup um, from the infection. So she was hospitalized for a week and we were finally able to bring her home. She um, came home and we did more preventative health care, cared for her. And then about two months later, she developed a mass in her reproductive tract uh, tumor. So then she had to go in for a salpingectomy, which is the removal of her oviduct uterus, um, her reproductive tract. And she's been great since then. So she, she's she got a really uh, amazing story because she's been on the brink of death more than once and has made it. That is not what we always see if we have people come in that are already um, experiencing reproductive disease. You know, sometimes we had a six-year-old hen that came over the winter and her whole reproductive tract had been calcified and we tried to remove it, but unfortunately lost her in surgery because she was so sick and it had been going on for so long mm. um, that she just, she didn't pull through and we see that. So we take egg laying very seriously at our home. Um, you know, there's tears when eggs are, sometimes when someone lays their first egg, we cry about it. It's, it's a uh, haunting to see eggs. Uh, it, it really is, wow. which is another reason that I have no problem just, just throwing them away. They're not, they're not a product of someone's hard work that they consented to. They're, they're a product of misery. And while we can feed some of them back and that's great, I don't find a need. I don't bat an eyelash if I throw an egg away. <laughs> mm, yeah. And you mentioned that you do sometimes feed them back. I think that just to clarify for people that don't realize sanctuaries will sometimes uh, 
feed the eggs back to the chickens, like cook them or somehow feed them back to the chickens and the chickens will eat their eggs, their unfertilized eggs to gain that nutrients back. But not all sanctuaries do that. And it, you know, it depends. And, and like you said, I mean, I appreciate what you say so much because it's true eggs, it's, it is, it's just a waste product. I mean, mm-hmm. we, it's, you know, like urine or anything else. We just exactly. need to yep. look at it as a waste product. It's, you know, it is not food. And when we consider it food is when these animals suffer. Uh, so yeah, I, I appreciated what you said there. So a really big part of, um, enforcing chickens as individuals to me is not using their eggs and not even speaking of eggs as something that must be used. I see a lot of dialogue in the sanctuary community about feeding eggs back, which is great. That's fine to talk about. Um, but I don't think we have to focus on what do we do with this, these eggs all the time. Um, and I think that I see even vegans giving away eggs to family members because they don't want them to go to waste. And the harm in this really is just reinforcing the idea that these animals have anything to provide for us. I think that is the most important thing we can consistently do is not exploit the animals in our care in any way, because that leads to a slippery slope. If we say it's okay to eat the eggs from our hens, or it's okay if our family, human family eats the eggs from our hens, um, we're really saying that exploitation is up for debate and that we get to pick and choose what we see as fit and that lends itself to to everyone else doing the same. So I think that's a really important reason to never ever um, even present chicken eggs as human food in any form. So you've told us about a few chickens in your care. Are there, is there anyone else you'd like to tell us about a story of someone that maybe touched your heart or had an interesting story? So I'll tell you a story about our rooster Scallop. Um, He has a story that is similar to many of our roosters and it's just as important and valuable as these more dramatic stories. So Scallop was dumped at an office park with two other roosters on. So this is just kind of a case of whenever we pick up dumped roosters, they're about four months old. They're about at that age when they start crowing um, and they usually get booted when they start crowing. So we went out there and there was Scallop and Roy and Captain Jack. So there were three roosters. And over the course of three visits, you know, we were able to get them Scallop. We finally got him by, we just had the door to the car open We chased him into the car with his two friends. So he was the last one we got. You know, he bonded instantly with other members of the rooster flock that he was matched up with. And for the last five years, he has been just an amazing welcomer to new roosters. He has just been a consistent good energy in the rooster flock and makes it easy for everyone to get along and you know, we get, we generally have six to eight roosters together at a time in that flock and Scallop has always been a part of it. And he was one of our original uh, founding roosters of our rooster flock. So Quincy, I ask all my guests this, and I'm going to ask you too, what gives you hope for the future? I would say that sanctuary work and the support from the community gives me a lot of hope. I really think that we are challenging views of non-humans in in a big way right now. And I think people are starting to see, you know, it doesn't feel as absurd anymore to, to, to talk about animal rights. And I don't feel, I don't feel as like on the edge if I just talk about, you know, chickens have the right to live. So I think that um, just like a general acceptance of Um, letting everyone live their life. It's going to give me a lot of hope. And hopefully we just keep seeing more and more people making that connection. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. It's been really wonderful to get to know you a bit and, uh, and to hear about your wonderful chickens and roosters. Um, And I appreciate the work you're doing. Thank you so much for being on today. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for having me again and letting me ramble about chickens. (laughs) I love it. Thank you for listening to the Hope for the Animals podcast. 
Quincy said something that really stuck with me. She said that it's haunting to see the eggs. For us humans that know the truth, that know the suffering the hens endure in any form of egg production, eggs aren't just this neutral thing. We certainly don't see them as food, but we also don't just see them as a neutral biological byproduct. We see them as symbols of suffering. And I think that this thinking, this knowledge can really help someone to avoid eggs, to stop eating eggs. They are symbols of suffering. But people like Quincy and places like Farmbird Sanctuary, they give me hope that we are moving toward a day when hens are free from the suffering and pain of reproductive manipulation to produce eggs for human consumption, a day when their brothers aren't seen as disposable and thrown away, I long for the day when sanctuaries of any kind are not needed and using and abusing animals for food is a thing of a violent and dark past and every domesticated animal is in the loving care of a caregiver. All the sanctuaries in this series are working toward that day and I encourage you to support them, find them on social media, they are some of the true heroes in our movement, along with the animals in their care. Those animals are their own heroes and have their own heroic stories. And that's what inspired me to do this series in the first place, was the inspiring stories of the animals in these micro sanctuaries on social media. Perhaps you might want to take in a farmed animal or other small animal in need. If you're considering this, there are wonderful resources out there now, including the Micro Sanctuary Resource Center website, and I'll have a link to that in the show notes. And if you thought that this series was important and inspiring, please share it with others. Give us a positive rating or review wherever you listen to your podcasts. And thank you for your support and your support of the micro sanctuaries in this series. And please live vegan.